choice camp. Um, over here you'll find the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, the NIAAA. AA is actually not squarely in the disease camp. I would, there's never been a statement that's come flat out and said addiction was a disease. I would put it kind of right here maybe. And over here you'll find a lot of different folks um, articulating what I call the choice argument. Um, there are a lot of libertarians in this argument. Um, there's a, a libertarian uh, editorialist journalist by the name of John Stossel who has a whole one hour show on why addiction is not a disease. He's in this camp. He makes that's a very excellent show. I recommend it very much. Um, and, and it's really their argument that wins the day on the gut level. It's the one that makes the most sense to me. Um, because what it says is that addiction can't be a disease because drug taking I is a choice. Real diseases, you know, like diabetes, don't involve choice. The diabetic didn't have the choice to get diabetes, but the drug addict did have the choice to start using drugs. Cancer is something that befalls an unfortunate person. Addicts do this to themselves. A and even though the addict will tell you that they can't stop, so says the choice argument, that they're powerless over As a matter of fact, they can, they can quit anytime they want. You just need to kind of motivate them to make the right choice. And the choice argument puts this assumption into motion with a very graphic example. It goes like this. I can take a syringe full of cocaine, and I can put it in front of an intravenous cocaine addict. For lack of a better name, let's call that addict Macaulay. And um, I can say, go ahead, Macaulay. No, really, it's on the house, spike up. And, and Macaulay, unable to believe his luck, will bare his arm, reach for the needle, and that's when I add a little twist. I say, oh, but Macaulay, you, you say you can't help yourself. You say you're powerless. But if you do choose to use that drug, then I'm gonna take out my nine millimeter and I'm going to blow your brains out. And I can vouch for Macaulay's thinking on this one. Uh, <laughs> faced with a gun to the head, he will choose not to use. And, and, and that's kind of the choice argument's point. You can't do that with real diseases. You can't do that with diabetes. You can't put a gun to the head of the diabetic and say, okay, better bring that blood sugar down to 100 or I'll blow your brains out. It, it's not gonna work. And the choice argument says that that's because there's a distinction between behaviors, which are always choices, and symptoms, which are part of a pathophysiologic disease process. In the case of diseases, free will plays no part. We don't hold patients responsible for their symptoms for the simple fact of the matter that they can't choose not to have them. And that's why punishing and coercing real patients is inappropriate, unethical, and in some cases even illegal. But in the case of drug taking, that's a behavior. All behaviors are choices. Free will exists. Responsibility attaches. The person can stop anytime they want. You just need to kind of, you know, motivate them to make the right choice. <laughs> and that's the choice argument. And, and, and that's the best argument I've ever heard against calling addiction a disease. And I guarantee you, I've heard them all because this is all I think about. And I think, <laughs> I think it's a darn good argument. But it's got problems. <laughs> and you can probably see some of them already. Um, there are diseases that involve choice. Type 2 diabetes involves a lot of choice about food choice. And it seems that the genetics of type 2 diabetes can drive the choices to eat the foods that produce the disease I in the first place. And so the clean distinction that the choice argument is trying to make here I is simply not clean. Most diseases have some kind of behavioral component to them. The question is, what's causing that patient to make that less healthy choice? You know, when we tell the patient, well, you need to stop smoking, you need to lose 10 pounds, and you need to... To, to, to lower your cholesterol, and they write it all down and they walk out of the office and they do exactly the opposite. What's going on there in that choice? And, and this, is why, this is why I find this subject so fascinating. This is why I find these, this group of patients um, so moving, is that um, you know, addicts, addicts are not supposed to contribute much to society. You know, their behavior is so horrible, we hardly even recognize them as patients. But addicts actually do a great deal for society. Um, very often we learn about how normal brains work by studying damaged brains. And addicts do nothing less than teach us how choice works. When do we have it? When does it fail us or we fail it? And what are the conditions under which choice best operates? And how do we set those conditions so that people can in fact make healthy choices in accordance with their values? And so. There's a lot riding on this disease thing. This is, uh, these are some of the, the big questions. These are questions that philosophers have struggled with for thousands of years. The nature of free will, the nature of human agency. This is one reason why I was brought to Utah because the dominant culture there, it's very important to them 
the nature of agency is really important to their theology. Uh, and, um, you know, this is what addicts, I think, are, are teaching us. And they are paying for these answers, these precious, precious answers, which benefit all of us with their suffering and their years spent in prison and their lives. And if we would only listen to them, we might know a great deal more about how we all make choices, how the human brain constructs something like free will. So as much as respect as I have for the choice argument, uh, and I do, I live with this argument, I think about it all the time, I think the preponderance of the evidence is on this side of the equation. So now that I've given you an argument against, let me try to make an argument for. And I think the first step in making the argument for addiction being a disease is to just admit tacitly that the behavior of addicts is very unpleasant. I'm not arguing that, okay? Addicts can be frustrating, they can be revolting, they can, they can even be criminal. I, I give you all of that. But just because we're dealing with bad behavior doesn't mean we can automatically assume that what's driving that bad behavior is some kind of, well, bad thing. All of these things at one time or another have been put forth as the cause of addiction. Addicts are sociopaths, liars, cheats, and thieves intrinsically. They have an addict personality. Their parents messed up, okay? Really, all of these things are the same thing, and that is badness. When we talk about, you know, an addict personality, what do we mean by that? We mean bad personality. Um, <laughs> here's the problem. We've been wrong about this sort of thing before in medicine. When I was in medical school, we believed that the cause of ulcer disease was an ulcer personality. Yeah, people who had ulcers, very hard charging, type A, smoked cig cigarettes, drank a lot of coffee, had high stress jobs like newspapers, and, and a lot of the treatment that we had for ulcer disease was either to remove half the stomach and then half the acid surgically, or to try to modify that ulcer personality. And today we know that uh, none of that is true, that ulcers are in fact caused by a bacteria. Um, when I, just before I got to medical school, we believed that the cause of schizophrenia was the mother. Yeah, she did it. She was too, uh, <laughs> too, too smothering, too cold and distant, and she, the mother, caused the schizophrenia. And now we know that uh, none of that is true. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Uh, <laughs> and see, this is the problem, is that there is this long and painful history in medicine of kind of looking at a group of people that we don't yet recognize as patients and becoming distracted by the very real and unpleasant behaviors and, and falling back into some kind of intrinsic feature of them as an explanation, and usually it's a bad feature. And time and time again, uh, these explanations have been shown to be wrong, wrong, wrong. Whether they're legal, whether, excuse me, whether they uh, use uh, uh, ethnicity or, or, or race or gender or personality as an explanation, these uh, explanations have been wrong and they've led to some pretty brutal treatments. And so whenever I hear the term addict personality, I've got to ask myself, how do we know we're not making that same mistake uh, again? As a matter of fact, none of these things are the real cause of addiction. We have better explanations based in brain science. And so perhaps you can see at its heart, this question is a question about causality. Yes, I'm seeing bad behavior, but what's the real cause of that behavior? Well, to answer this question, we have to ask another question, which is, how do we typically show cause in medicine? What is the causal model that we use in medicine today to describe human illness? In other words, what is disease? What do you have to do to be a real disease and get into that disease club like diabetes and cancer? Well, you see what I'm trying to do here? If we could come up with a good definition and if I could fit addiction to that, the argument should be won. The problem is, it's hard to get a consensus idea of what constitutes disease, even within medicine. The World Health Organization says that disease is not just the presence of illness, but the absence uh, of well-being. And I, I think that sounds very nice, but it's awfully subjective. I mean, what's well-being? I mean, it's too squishy. If we're ever going to have any hope of showing that addiction is or is not a disease, we need a definition that is so tough, so rigorous, that everyone can agree on it. And so to find that definition, the essence of that word disease as we use it in medicine today, you have to go back in the history of the word a little bit, and fortunately you don't have to go back too far. Our modern concept of disease is only about 100 years old, and it emerged from the work of these four doctors, Louis, Bobby, Rudy, and Iggy. <laughs> They're kind of the, the pep boys of the disease model. 
Louis was Louis Pasteur, the uh, founder of germ theory.